No-nonsense Forex traders, you already know this. If somebody were to walk up to you and offer you something with a 1,000% return, a 10 to 1 return on your money, you know exactly what to do. You call them a derogatory name, you turn around, and you walk the other way because you are being scammed. We all know by now the math isn't there and the probabilities are extremely low with something like this. On the other hand, a 1,000% return in a uranium mining stock, for example? Well, that's just what uranium mining stocks do. Oh, that's right, traders. The loud intro is back, I think. I'm not going to know until I upload it, but I hope it is. A big shout out to the programmers at Screencast-O-Matic Screencasting Software for finally getting the microphone and the computer sounds to play at the same time. It only took you 25 updates. Way to go. Anyway, I digress, traders. This is a big video um, in length and in importance. Now, this is not a typical video you would expect to see from this channel. We have talked about gold mining stocks in the past. Um, but stay with me on this. Uh, first of all, understand I am not a licensed financial advisor, nor will I ever be. Uh, your results are your own. Uh, understand that part. Now, who is this video for? I'm starting to do slides like this now. Um, is this for new traders? Is this for seasoned traders? This video is actually for everybody. Um, anybody can invest in uranium mining stocks as long as you have access to the over-the-counter market or the TSX, TSXV market. Um, it wouldn't be terrible if you also had access to the Australian market too, but not everybody does. Um, but these things are also very cheap in a lot of ways. Some are as low as five, ten cents a share, uh, which is great. That means everybody gets to play. So that's cool. Um, but who this video is really not for are those of you out there that small, you know, selected few who already know a lot about uranium mining stocks. Um, you might have been looking for a video to further that knowledge. This is not going to be it. Now, this is more of an introduction video for no-nonsense Forex traders and people who are just kind of looking for other places to put their money in this decade, um, which most of us in the trading world are doing. Um, and this is one of my favorite places to put my money, um, especially going forward, considering the upside and the downside, which we're going to talk about. Uh, so in this video, before we even go forward, uh, something with this high of a return usually triggers alarm bells in most people, especially people on this channel. Um, but we have to understand there is a real, real asymmetry here. And we're going to go over that before we get too deep into the actual uh, uranium bits. Um, but uranium is what goes into nuclear energy. And nuclear energy really doesn't get talked about a whole lot these days, which is weird. I think there is a definite reason for that. But uh, we're also going to talk about why it is one of, if not the best, energies going forward and how uranium is going to play a part. Uh, we're also going to talk about what, when you, if you're going to go this route and invest in uranium stocks, there's a certain way to do it. We did this with gold mining stocks. We're going to do the similar setup with uranium stocks, but a little bit different. You'll see about that. And uh, then resources. I actually put all the really good resources in the blog for this episode. I will link the blog in the description down below, or you can just go to nonsenseforex.com slash blog, and uh, it should be near at or near the top, depending on when you're watching this video. But the blog is huge. It's about 5,000 words. It has tons of resources and further explanation on what we're about to talk about today. So without further ado, let's get into it. These, to me, are the main types of investments that people can go after, and whether or not I think they are a good idea or not. All right, so stay with me on this. Now you have short term, so really short time frame, but the promise of big returns or the hope of big returns. No matter how you say it, it's a bad idea. This is what we talked about at the first 10 seconds of this video. This is somebody trying to get one over on you. You don't get a 10 to 1 return on anything right away. At least if you do, you can do it another 200 times and it's not going to go your way and then you're going to be in the hole. Always a bad idea. Avoid any kind of trades or investments like this. On the other hand, 
if you have a short time frame, but small returns. Now, this is more realistic. Um, you can pass this or you can fail this, but this is what we do in Forex trading. You know, we take our small gains. Sometimes they're a little bit larger um, than small, but they're not 10 to 1. Uh, we know that. You know, we take we take losses along the way. You know, it's it's a grind. You know, this is what we do day to day. And this is something that is not only fine, this is what people should do if you're good at it. Um, because you can always have that engine going on day after day after day. It's awesome. Uh, now, if you want to go long term, if you have a long time horizon, um, but you're only going after really small returns, you're really just trying to keep the money you have safe. You really don't care if it grows a whole lot. That's where you start getting into bonds. Um, I actually don't think bonds are a great idea going forward. We are in a bit of a bond bubble. Now, we have been in a bond bubble for a long time, and it hasn't popped. Um, but the longer we wait, the closer we are to it. Uh, I just am not really bullish on these things going forward. But I don't think most people watching this channel are really interested in bonds anyway. Um, now here, and I had to put this word a little smaller so it would fit on the screen. If you have a long-term time horizon, you're okay waiting. Um, because what you're waiting for is the possibility of a really, really big return, well, then mining stocks are for you um, because that's pretty much what you're looking at. And they go in cycles, you know, not defined cycles, but you can definitely tell when they're cheap and you can definitely tell when they're expensive. And if something is cheap, that is when you really want to start looking at it. And that's where we are with uranium mining stocks as of this video's publication date. Now, people might be concerned about the probability of these things actually hitting. Um, now, I come from the penny stock world. A lot of you guys know this. Most penny stocks are a terrible idea. Even though they can promise really high returns, the probability of you hitting one is so low. And then once most people actually get in one that does run, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to manage their money or scale out or do anything like that. So even the ones that get lucky and hit one don't make a lot of money. It's a really bad arena to play in. Uh, I'm glad I left, but I'm glad I was there because I learned a lot from there. What I learned later on about mining stocks is if you are, if the underlying asset of a penny stock is something like gold, for example, and gold is at a low point in the cycle, it's considered very cheap, well, then it's okay to enter gold mining stocks because there's a really good possibility, especially if there's a bunch of nonsense going on in the overall market, which there certainly is and has been, well, then that's a good place to put your money because then you can actually not only protect it by buying physical gold, but take participation in the big run-up by leveraging it a bit further into mining stocks. Um, those are when penny stocks and low cap stocks are actually okay because not only is the possibility of hitting them pretty high, um, the returns you can get can be absolutely tremendous. Um, there are people in the commodity space, this is how they made their entire fortunes. There's 100 millionaires and billionaires who did nothing but invest in this space, bought things when they were cheap and sold them when they were expensive and just waited for that cycle to come around again. Because unlike the stock market, the rate of return on these stocks is much, much higher. Now, you would think with something super high like that, that the probabilities would be really low. I don't think they are. I think, all right, let's just say, for example, that you got to play a coin flipping game and you got to put your money down. Now, if you lost the coin flip, you would lose your money. But if you won the coin flip, you wouldn't just win the amount you invested. Let's say you would win five times the amount you invested. Like you have this crazy asymmetrical coin flip game that you could play. I would first see if there were any catches. I would do my due diligence and be like, okay, why is something, why does something like this exist? It makes no sense. Um, but if I knew it was legit, I would play this game all the time and I would make a lot of money. You know, anybody who understands basic probabilities would do the exact same thing. Here's the thing with the probability though. I don't think the uranium market is a coin flip. I think it's pretty much coming no matter what, uh, which would make it more like a dice roll if the only way you could lose is if you took two dice and you rolled a two or a three. Like literally any other number would pay you off and pay you off really well. That's why I'm so into things like this. You have this asymmetry. Now, if this was the case, why don't more people do this? Well, I think most people just don't know, 
And the people who know a little something about it either hate uranium because uranium is connected to nuclear energy, which is very hated, especially in the Western world. I think that the fact uranium stocks are low cap and micro cap stocks turns a lot of people off because they see something like that and they automatically think it's too risky. And I don't think a lot of people want to wait, you know, five, eight, ten years for their investment to pay off. Now, I don't. I think we're at a certain point in the cycle where we may not have to wait five, eight, ten years. This may come much sooner than many of us expect. And so I want to get this video out now and try to get you as up to speed as much as possible, and then you can make your own decision from there. Um, but just understand, this whole thing fits in really well with what we do here at the channel. Uh, we take risks, and what do we do with those risks? We minimize them along the way. It's really that simple, and it's what all the great investors do. Um, so in trading, we do this with money management and trading psychology. Uh, we do it with an algorithm, too, uh, but most, most importantly, we do it with money management and psychology. And the way you can really reduce risks in the investment world is by doing your research ahead of time and then having a money management strategy in place. And we're going to go over both those things here. The research part, more in the blog, but the money management part, we will definitely tackle here on the video. Now, this is nuclear energy we're talking about. Most people in the Western world see this sign. It is not a positive thing. Um, we are conditioned to think about nuclear meltdowns. And really, that's about all we're conditioned to think about. I mean, how many of you even knew uranium went into nuclear energy? You know, most of you probably did. Some of you probably didn't because it just doesn't get talked about especially not now. You know, the big debate is green energy versus fossil fuels. You know, people don't even mention nuclear energy. And if I was debating green energy, I probably wouldn't either because that's just not a fair fight. Nuclear would crush. Let's look at some stats on nuclear real quick. It's already here and it's going, by the way, even though we don't hear about it. There's about 440 nuclear reactors worldwide. Um, I don't know if the majority of them are operational. I would say most of them probably are. Um, in one country, they're not. We'll talk about that. Uh, it is 10% of the entire world's energy, as seldom as anybody talks about it. Um, this is what 10% of the world runs on. And I got a map to show you later. And you can kind of see where uh, the concentration of this nuclear energy actually is. Um, it's 15% of the energy in the United States. Americans, you even know that? <laughs> it's, it's a lot. You know, the United States is the number one consumer of nuclear energy in the world. With all the solar panels and wind turbines we've put up and with all the oil we've drilled, we still depend on nuclear energy heavily. Uh, but that's good because uh, did you know uh, when it doesn't melt down, which is really rare, and it's gotten safer and safer tremendously since Fukushima, it's a great energy fuel to have. Because you want to talk about green energy, this is it. Now, most people don't want you to know this part. They want you to think that solar panels and wind turbines and hydroelectric and all that are the cleanest ways to go. They are certainly not. Um, I've actually looked into this quite a bit, and I've been on top of this for a while uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I invest in the space. But two... And this is the first time I'm really kind of coming out with something like this. You know, people will comment on the channel and say, oh, you sound like a Republican. You sound like a Democrat. I'm neither one. You know, that falls into groupthink, and you guys know how I feel about that. I go right on a lot of things. I go left on some things. And one of the things I certainly do go left on is the environment. I'm a conservationist. I care deeply about the environment. I love it when companies just get cornholed by fines because they didn't go along with their environmental guidelines, because what happens is the very next year, they do go along with those guidelines, and they still make a lot of money. So just do it right. You know, I'm glad you got fined. You know, that's how I feel. But make no mistake, I am not and will never be one of these people, you know, bouncing a sign up and down and chanting and accomplishing absolutely nothing. You know, I, you know, I am a, an environmentalist, I guess you could say by title, but, you know, not to this degree. And I shouldn't really hate on people like this. If I was this young, I would probably be heavily influenced too. I mean, you could pretty much tell me anything. You know, when you're young, you can propagandize people like this. And that's why they trot young people out there. You know, one, because it plays into people's emotions and they're like, oh, look at the children. They really care. Um, and two, these are the exact kind of people you can indoctrinate into feeling a certain way. And you're not going to present both sides of the argument when you do that. You're only going to give them one 
they're going to believe it, and they're going to go with it. Now, thankfully, as a natural resources investor, I'm able to kind of take a step back and see things for what they actually are. And one thing I do know is most of these you know, environmentalists that shade more to the crazy side are really pointing their pistols in the wrong direction because it's not the Western world that is responsible for most of the pollution. Uh, yet for some reason, this is what we really need to pay all of our attention to. Not really. I don't know if people just don't think it's fashionable to point the finger at the places who are doing most of the polluting. I don't know. I have my theories. I don't want to get too deep into this. I told myself I wouldn't. I mean, I could go way, way deep um, in terms of my, my thoughts on the environment. Um, but that doesn't really help you. So let's move on to the things that actually do. Now, with solar and wind power, there was a big movement. It was back in 2017. I remember it very, very clear. You know, climate change was a thing that we talked about, um, but it wasn't on the forefront. Um, because you know, climate change is something that actually happens really slowly. Um, but in 2017, I don't know if a, a certain study came out or what it was, but like all of a sudden, half of the Western world thought we're all going to die in 20 years unless we do something now, 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 now. Uh, what I think this really was, and you know, call me a conspiracy theorist if you want, but pretty sure uh, the elites out there already had their chips down and their money behind a lot of the green technology that we see coming around the corner today. And they just wanted to front run it, and they wanted to get most of the Western world on their side. So they would vote for people who are very pro-green energy, ensuring that this whole technology would be the next wave of the future. Um, and I like the technology. Uh, don't get me wrong. I like the fact that we're thinking about it. I like the fact that we're caring about it. And uh, I like the improvements that are being made. Um, but those improvements are being made very slowly. Um, people just think this is a, a catch-all solution. It's totally not especially the current iterations of solar and wind that we have. Uh, it's not even close to what you would get out of fossil fuels or nuclear. And I think we're able to get away with it because, you know, the economy does pretty much suck everywhere, but the stock market's still doing really good, and that's the numbers and the metrics that people look at. I think once that starts coming down as well, especially if it really crashes, we're going to have to go with what works. And what really works right now is not solar and wind, um, especially because you can't you can't even really put it in most of the developed world, and you better put it in the right place, or else you're going to suffer. Germany is a very good example of this. Um, they thought they wanted to be all righteous and on the right side of history and be one of the first countries to really mandate green energy. Um, so they pretty much took everything that was running on fossil fuels and replaced it with solar and wind. Problem is, Germany is not a very sunny country, nor is it a very windy country. And so things failed so badly that everybody's power bills skyrocketed. They are now the number one country in terms of expensive um, power and utility bills. And they had to turn to coal <laughs> just to keep the lights on. So it just goes to show you, when the chips are down, people are going to turn to what works. And I think we're in a really great stock market right now. The economy sucks, but you know, as far as the actual metrics go that people look at, it's still really high. I think once that crashes and things get really bad, everybody's going to turn to what works. And what works really well is nuclear energy. And even if you look at it from a climate change perspective, we don't reverse climate change or what is currently perceived as climate change without nuclear energy somewhere in the mix. Now, the big difference is everybody is talking about green energy. So a lot of money has already gone into that space. Now, I'm almost waiting for it to pull back a bit. But nobody's talking about nuclear energy. And you are going to need it just as much, which means there is a ton of value there as we speak. Now, remember always, for natural resource investors here, or if you, maybe you're a budding natural resource investor, you know, but because you are we realize it's not what our heart is saying. It's not what we want for the future. It's what's actually going to happen. If the future, in, you know, in my view, is actually coal, and I could break down why, I would do that, and I would invest in coal, and I wouldn't think twice about it. You know, it's coming anyway, whether I invest in it or not. Uh, but fortunately, I think the good times for coal are over. Green is definitely happening. 
but nuclear is definitely happening too, so let's talk about it. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the downsides of nuclear energy. There is, there's nothing out there that just has nothing but upside. Uh, nuclear definitely has downsides too. As most of us know, you had three major nuclear accidents in our history. One of them was Three Mile Island back in 78. Then you had Chernobyl. I think there's a documentary on Amazon or Netflix right now talking about just how bad it was and how the effects still linger. And then you had Fukushima in 2011. Now, these environmental effects are horrible, and they're long-lasting, and the effects are felt like generations down the line. Uh, but the reality is, most of the world still needs nuclear energy in some capacity. Now, what that capacity is, we'll go over in a moment, but it's still going to be here, and the good news, if there is any, is when really bad things like this happen, the safety gets better. Um, Fukushima was a generation two reactor that just happened to be built in a tsunami zone, like a total, <laughs> like, why would you do that? Um, but then a really gigantic earthquake happened. Like all these things had to happen all at the same time just for this thing to melt down. But it made everybody perk up and say, Hey, if we have a generation two reactor, we need to fortify this and improve the safety measures in that reactor, or we risk the same thing happening to us. And so they did. And Generation 3 and Generation 4 reactors are already being made, and those things are damn near impossible to break down with all the safety measures they have in place. So another nuclear accident is not impossible. And if a nuclear accident did happen, all of your uranium mining stocks would absolutely crater. But you just have to do the math in your head. You're like, what are the probabilities of this actually happening? I think those probabilities are very low and low enough for me to go ahead and move forward in this space. Um, but we can't sit there and pretend like there isn't a downside because there certainly is. Now, what are the upsides? We've already gone over a lot of them, but let's go over them again. It is by far the cleanest energy out there. It is carbon zero. You know, why aren't more people excited about that? Well, I think it's because nuclear just gets such a bad name because when it melts down, it's really, really bad. Um, but if you look at it pound for pound, what it does every day, it produces really clean energy. It produces less waste than anything else out there. The, the waste is very dense. You can recycle a lot of it. It's a really nice little system. Um, it is the cheapest overall. It is the most efficient overall, more efficient than fossil fuels. And it runs a lot longer than solar and wind. I, oh God, I don't have the data right in front of me, nor do I want to dig it up right now. But I think as far as days out of the year, it almost doubles what you would get out of solar. And I think wind is pretty close to the same. But you have all these things working in its favor. Uh, so, again, it doesn't really come down to what we think in our own little brains, what the, the best option is for this planet. It really matters as investors is what is coming around the corner. Now, we look at supply and demand. When we're investing, we want decreased supply and increased demand. And I think that's exactly what we have. Uh, first off, to give you an idea, this is a map of where most nuclear reactors are currently. Um, so you have a lot of them all over the world that are still cranking and still need uranium. And there's more on the way. So for starters, let's just talk about the ones that are coming back online. Japan shut all 54 of their nuclear reactors down once Fukushima happened. Japan was one of the largest consumers of nuclear energy in the world. They have nine back online and they're slowly bringing on more. So you have that going on. And you also have a bunch of them being built. Um, in particular, they're more concentrated in your Eastern Hemisphere countries like Russia, China, India, UAE. Uh, you got to remember, a lot of these places have governments to where the people don't really have a voice, um, which is unfortunate, but when you only have one voice, you can actually get stuff done. And like I said, too, when the chips are down, you're going to go for the most efficient option. You know, everything else be damned. And that's what they've chosen. And these reactors cost billions of dollars to build. And you're not going to build a nuclear reactor, which costs you billions of dollars, if you're not going to use it. So not only do you have Japan slowly bringing the, all their nuclear uh, consumption back online, you have new reactors already added to the 440 we already have. And guess what they're going to need to run? They're going to need uranium. I think the demand is certainly going to be there, and it's going to be there in spades. Now let's talk about the supply. Uranium, I can't think of any other metal that really 
does this um, in terms of you know what you have to actually mine out of the ground. So it's not gold to where like with gold, only 10% of it is used for industrial purposes anyway. And if you want to get that gold back at any point in time, you could get most of it back. Um, silver, not so much. Um, half of it is used in industrial purposes and a lot of it gets burnt up and it goes to silver heaven. Um, but half of it isn't, you know, so you don't have too much of a supply crunch there. You do more than gold, but definitely not to the degree you would with uranium. Uh, copper is very industrial, but at any point in time, you can take it back. And that's why everybody was stealing copper wire back in the day, <laughs> because you can take it and reuse it somewhere else. But uranium is different. Once you use it, it's pretty much gone. It does produce waste that you can recycle, but it doesn't have anywhere near the efficiency of actual enriched uranium. Um, so once you use it, it's gone, and you have to go mine more. So in my view, it's a really nice little perfect storm of things you need to happen to have an upcoming supply crunch. Remember, this uranium is only found in a handful of countries and not a whole lot of it. Now, before I move on, I just want to put this in there. I know in the comments section, somebody's going to talk about thorium. They say, oh, it's so much better than uranium. It's, you know, it, it won't melt down, all this kind of stuff. Thorium is kind of the same as, uh, I think you guys know my view on asteroid gold. <laughs> it's like, okay, there might be a lot of gold on that asteroid up there, but there's no way we're getting there anytime soon. Um, so it's not realistic. Um, with thorium, if I'm going to get nerdy with it, you actually have to enrich it so much that it actually becomes a uranium isotope. It's not very abundant. Uh, it doesn't really play well with uranium in the whole nuclear fission space. It's just not a great option, and we're not going to see it for another 10, 15 years. So don't worry about thorium. Let's actually focus on uranium itself and how we can put our money down and what affects the price. Um, fun fact, you can actually hold this in your hand. It's not enriched. Uh, nothing will happen to you until you actually enrich it, and that's where the radioactive properties come out. But here is what you have to know when it comes down to actually investing in it. First off, the spot price matters a lot because... There, when, when the spot price drops, which it did after Fukushima, it dropped so much that it just wasn't effic efficient for most uranium mines to actually mine and produce uranium. And it wasn't cost effective for the people who enrich it to enrich it and actually use it. So we had enough to you know, keep the lights on, but that's about all we had. And it's not going to get better until that spot price goes up. Uh, we'll look at the spot price in a bit. There's some really interesting little idiosyncrasies you're going to see about the current spot price as we sit here right now. Um, in the uranium mining space, there's really two main companies. There's Kazatoprom in Kazakhstan, and most of their uranium just gets used up by the Kazakhs and the Russians. And then in North America, you have Cameco in Saskatchewan, I believe in Canada. And uh, after that, you have a huge drop off in production. So it's really beneficial to keep an eye out on what Kazataprom and Cameco are doing, because a lot of times that can be the bellwether for what you see coming up with the smaller producers, which a lot of us are going to be involved in. Um, both of these producers have gone offline. Um, Cameco shut down MacArthur River. It's one of their largest mines. And Kazataprom went completely down for four months. Now, you just don't make up that production in four months. That's a big drop. Um, and it's going to be hard to make up that supply. You know, they do have above ground resources, but those only last so long too. So a supply crunch, in my opinion, is really coming and you only have to look at the top two in this space to see why. Um, now about those smaller producers, this is where your really big returns are going to happen once the spot price gets up to a level where people can start producing again. Um, now it's it's like anything. It's, it's like gold mining too. If you don't do the right research and you don't find good companies, this run is going to happen and those companies still aren't going to make a lot of money. There's companies out there who aren't permitted. Um, they've been down for a really long time. You know, ownership sucks. You want to avoid companies like that and you're going to need to know who they are. Uh, now, the good news is that the uranium space is very, very small. So you can do this on your own or you can find somebody else. We'll talk about that in a moment as well. Um, but back in the last uranium run, which I think was 2000 to 2006 was the height of it. Um, if you would have picked the five junior mining uranium companies that did really well, and there weren't many out there, 
Um, so when I say five, you're like, oh, five out of a hundred? No, no, a lot less than that. If you were just to be, if you had your money on those five, the one who performed the worst had a twenty-two to one return on your money, peak to trough. I think the best one was a one hundred to one return. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Um, but you had to know which ones to pick. On the blog, I have a video of the billionaire investor who did just that. He was in all five of them, and he talks about it. It's a really good video. Definitely check that out after the after this video is done. Um, but this time around, the reason why I didn't put those numbers at the very beginning of my video, and I said more of a 10 to 1, is because I'm keeping my expectations tempered. I don't foresee 100 to 1 returns happening this time around. Um, now, 10 to 1 is definitely something I'm very, very interested in, and I think you should be too. Um, but 100 to 1, I don't think so. Uh, first of all, there's a lot more companies in the space now. It's still a really small space, but it was a tiny space back in, uh, back in the 2000s. And so with more companies, you have more places to where the money's going to go, and you also have dilution with those companies. Um, they issued a lot more shares in the last 10 years, um, which means their upside is capped even further. On top of that, you have what's going on in the gold mining space right now, you have ETFs and royalty companies, which were not there 20 years ago, that are there now. Now, only lunatics like you and I are going to put our money in these junior mining uranium stocks. Most people, if they are going to enter the space, they're probably not, but if they are, they're going to go towards the more safer investments. And those are always in the mining space, your ETFs and your royalty companies which means that's money that is not going to go into the juniors. Um, so I, I think a lot of my gold mining stocks and silver, silver mining stocks would have really, really taken off by now had it not been for this one little caveat that exists today that did not exist 20 years ago. But um, would you like a 1,000% return on your investment, even if you had to wait five to eight years? I certainly would. So really, this return is nothing to sneeze at, even if I'm playing it really conservatively. We might have stocks that go much higher than that. I just don't know. Um, I just I do know that, that there are different circumstances this time around, um, and I've seen it happen in the gold and silver mining space. But then again, those ETFs and those royalty companies are going to get really expensive, and when the people who are really late to the party still want to put their money in this space, they're going to turn to the juniors, and the upside is going to be there. Just not, just don't get allured when you hear these stories of you know twenty two to one and one hundred to one type returns, um, because one that's if you played it perfectly from a money management standpoint, which is almost impossible. And uh, I just don't see those returns coming around at this time. I hope I'm wrong, um, but it's still certainly worth my time and my money to be in this space for when the time does come. Um, I would love just a 400% return on a stock five to eight years from now. I will do that every time. I will dream of a 400% return on a stock you know, five to eight years from now. Um, but what I will not do is dream about a 22 uh, times return on anything, because that's just not realistic, especially this time around. Now, the big question a lot of people ask, and they ask this in every space, you know, stocks, metals, crypto, everything, uh, is the question of when. When can we expect this thing to really take off? And they want an actual defined time, uh, which I think this question is completely ridiculous. Uh, what people are really asking, uh, usually, you know, I get this in my comment section sometimes, and I see it on TV. You know, it's mostly somebody, it's mostly a really unsophisticated investor that just wants to know, how much longer can I take absolutely no risk with my money before the time is right to where I put my money down and the very next day this thing takes off and goes bananas? How would anybody know that? The smartest guy in the space doesn't know that. Um... I do see people get interviewed on TV, some experts, and they actually try to answer this question. And I don't know why they do it. They're just hurting their credibility. Or what they're doing is they're, they're going to be wrong nine times, and the tenth time they're right, and they get to go down as the person who called the run. Maybe that's what they're doing. I don't know. But I don't want you to concern yourself with this question. This is a long-term investment. All right? Just get comfortable with that. Now, the good news is, is a lot of time has already passed where uranium stocks have been absolutely dirt cheap and haven't really gone anywhere. Um, let me show you a chart of the uranium spot price over the years. 
So here we have the spot price of uranium. Now ignore what's over here on the right margin. I don't even really know what this is. This is the price in United States dollars right over here. Um, as it stands right now, this chart is a little bit backdated. I think the spot price is right about $30 um, a pound. Most people in the industry say that anywhere from $50 to $60 a pound is that magic range where things really start getting good and a lot of these junior producers can come back online. And a lot of the mines that Cameco shut down or Kazataprom shut down can start operating again as well and then things start getting really good again. Now if you just look at this chart, you might say to yourself, well, you know, maybe the spot price isn't really cheap right now and there and therefore uranium stocks aren't very cheap because look at it. Three years ago it was at 20 and now it's at 30, maybe I'm getting in too late. Uh, well, you're not because let's pull it back and it only goes as far as 2008, oh, 2007, okay. So this was kind of the, the height of the boom and things fell off and they got good again and then that's Fukushima and then crash. So here are the real takeaways. One, don't ever think that uranium stocks are not cheap because they absolutely are and they're not going to get moving at all until price really starts coming more like up here where my crosshair is or even higher. So there is still time. But you also notice what we saw in the version of the chart I showed you a little bit ago. This thing is on an uptrend. Little by little with these waves, spot price is getting more and more expensive. You know, there's something bubbling up. This is what I really like to see. I don't want to invest down here because I'm not getting any upward movement. So to me, you know, price can still go down a lot. But when things are officially back on the upswing, which overall they are, that's when I'm really excited about getting in. Now, we don't have our MT4 charts to chart uranium to help us out here. So we need all the help we can get. Um, so things like this, I think, really do tell a tale. I think right now is a really good time to put your plan in place if this is a space you want to be in. Um, I certainly do. I'm in this space already, and I'm still learning more. Because by doing this now, we already have all of this futility behind us. And it looks like there's going to be bluer skies ahead. When? We don't know. But why screw around? <laughs> why be aware of something like this, be aware of the return, and have it take off you know, without you? you know, put in the work as soon as you can. Uh, because I really do think right now, you know, as I shoot this towards the end of 2020, it's a great time to be in this space. So let's say you're on board too. You're like, this sounds awesome. Um, I love the risk versus the return. I'm okay with waiting a while. Um, I want to know more about this space. I'd like to invest in this space. Well, let's talk about what you need to do now. Now, during uh, this video here, I think, it, I don't know what it was called. I think if you just go to my channel and uh, click uh, the magnifying glass and type in gold mining, I think this video will pop up. We talked about the best way to take a metal or any natural resource and how to diversify your own little mini portfolio within that space for the best probability of really nice returns. If you remember, I said put a soccer team together. You know, you have your, your goalie, your defenders, your mids, and your forwards. You need more defensive plays like having actual gold and paper gold, and then one level up from that, your ETFs, your royalties, and things like that, along with your junior miners. I have a feeling a lot of people are just going to take the cheaper route go with nothing but junior miners, they're going to end up being right about the fact that uranium is going to take off one day, but they're still not going to make a lot of money because most of those trades are going to flop. Diversification is really key here. Um, so, But this is the uranium space, okay? So your team's going to look a little different. I like it like this. Um, first of all, you're not allowed to hold actual uranium. Uh, you're going to get a knock on your door. <laughs> that's, that's ridiculous. So, and the, plus the, the space is much smaller and there's only so many ways you can go about it, but you need to take advantage of all of those ways. Um, so down here, you have the ETFs. There are four, to my knowledge. Um, I'm not going to go look at them right now, but URA is kind of the OG. They've been around the longest. Now, they readjusted 
what they you know, the components of their ETF back in 2018, and they substituted in. They got rid of some actual uranium miners, and they substituted in a lot of um, like uranium construction companies or construction companies uranium mines would use. So if you think that's a pretty slick idea, then check out URA. Um, but if you don't like that and you want more of a pure play um, ETF, again, this is not financial advice, but take a look at ticker symbol URNM. Um, that's much more along the lines of the actual spot price of uranium. It's probably going to follow that when it's all said and done. Um, and there's a couple other ones. They're more obscure. Um, but do your due diligence here. And then royalty companies have entered the fray as well. Royalty companies are great because they protect their downside because they don't have to build a mine. They don't have to mine anything. They just take pieces of it. Um, they help other mines get some of their uh, other mining companies get some of their smaller mines up and running in exchange for a little piece of the action. It's really nice. It's a great upside downside play. Um, but the upside here is generally limited to where the junior miners are the ones that are, that are going to go nuts, um, assuming you pick the right ones. So if uranium does take off, you're going to make a bunch of money here and you're going to make a lot of money here if you do it right. It's the best of everything. You know, you might have, you know, let's say you have five junior miners and two of them flop. Well, you did your due diligence, so you know what the good companies are. And so three of them went crazy. And then you just add on all of this prosperity as well. It really is the best way to play it. And you can build this team over time. You don't have to put all of your money in, into everything like this right now. Um, so it's cool. But this is definitely, in my opinion, what you want to shoot for. Now, you might be saying, hey, uh, I would love to do some research in this space. Where the hell do I go? This is the first time I'm even hearing about this. Uh, well, there's a lot of really good people you can follow out there, but definitely follow somebody. I don't think this is something as much enthusiasm as you might have behind uranium, of all things, because you're just crazy. Uh, don't get good at it yourself before putting your money down. It's going to take too long. Uh, there are people out there who have been in the space for a long time. They know all the owners to these companies. They've actually been to some of the mines. You know, those are the people you really want to follow. Um, and they're everywhere. And they have free channels and free information. And there's some people with paid newsletters, too. Um, I'm not against either one. You just have to go find them and find out, you know, really what works for you. And I'm going to make it easy for you on the blog. If you scroll down maybe two-thirds of the way, I start talking about some of the free YouTube channels that are out there that I think are very good and uh, where you can find people who have paid newsletters as well. Um, so there you are. I had to go find all this shit myself, and I am giving it all to you. You're welcome. Now, you better know what you're doing once you have put your money down on these stocks or else there's a really good chance you're going to screw it up. And wouldn't that be unfortunate if you were right about the race and right about the horses, but still found a way to not make a lot of money off this, considering the amount of time it takes for these things to come around? Well, that's what the buy and hold video is for. I hope you guys have watched that video. I will link this one down below as well. It's required viewing for anybody who wants to invest in anything. Because as no nonsense Forex traders know, no money management, no money. And that's kind of important. So here is what I would like you to do. Um, go to, I love Google Docs because it's on the cloud. It's there forever. No matter what happens to your computer, um, it's always going to be there and you can go reference it later. Um, so take a Google Doc and write these things down. And the, the big thing is, is you have to commit to them. Because let me tell you, when these stocks run, you're not going to want to stick to the rules you put down in the past. It's just not going to happen. You know, so it's going to move 500% in the matter of a week. You told yourself to take profit at this point, and you're not going to want to because you're going to think in your head, what would this look like if it went up another 500%? You know, that's just how our dumb brains think. So write these things down and stick to it. Whatever the stock is, when you entered, exactly when you're going to scale out. And I should have also added how much, you know, are you going to take half off? Or are you going to take a third off? Have these rules written down and stick to them. All right. Always keep it real. And then your exit price, you're going to have to exit at some point. What is going to determine that? All right. Again, we don't have our charts to help us. 
So we're going to need to pick a time, we're going to need to pick a price, and we're going to need to stick to it. Because when that day comes, we are not really going to want to exit because we've seen so much upside already. We're dreaming of how much more upside there can be in the future. Um, but if you're going to make any money in this game, you have to take profit and you have to take your money off the table at some point. Because we've all seen how cyclical these things are. And we know the probability is not very high, but if we're riding high on the hog and we're making a lot of money off these stocks and the nuclear disaster happens the very next day, it's going to wipe us out. It's going to take off a lot of the profit that we worked so hard and waited so long to make. Don't let bad money management, bad psychology, and external factors wipe out the money you make. So that's all I got. In conclusion, um, I love this sector. You know me. I obsess about my downside. I try to do things in a really mathematically intelligent way. Um, yet I love uranium mining stocks, which seems like the biggest gamble in the world if you don't really think about it. But if you do think about it, the upside to downside is absolutely there. Um, probably more so here than any other place I can even think of. Uh, so it's definitely something to look at. Now, you could still lose everything. Understand that. Um, if you put your money down, there's a nuclear meltdown the very next day, it's gone. Or it's going to be at such low levels, you're not going to want to wait another 15 years for it to come back. Um, but thankfully, we're in a pretty good time, in my opinion. Uh, so do your homework. Um, I give you resources on the blog. Have a plan and stick to it. I didn't spend a whole lot of time on that slide, but that might be the most critical slide out of everything because I would hate for you to go through all this and not make money. Um, but I really do think it's going to be worth it. That's just me. I'm one guy. I'm not certified to do anything. Uh, but if you're on board with this, definitely go to the blog right after. I got so much cool stuff on that thing for you. I put a lot of work into it. And if you like hearing me ramble about stuff like this, I got more rambling coming your way in the form of more videos. So subscribe and hit the bell. You don't want to miss them. This is, by nature, a Forex trading channel, but if you can get the investment part right and you can have that machine going in the background while you're having success trading, that's really where the game is won. Uh, so don't sleep on these investment videos. I'll keep bringing them your way. You continue to put in the work and go get it.